I lived three and a half years in Afghanistan and feel compelled to share what comes up in the world and in Afghanistan. By no means I'm going to analyze the situation or even try to be comprehensive. My sense is to share with you what comes up for me, the things that I see, the things that I notice, and zone in to a few issues that spread wider than Afghanistan and are more a theme that I see that connects a whole lot more than the problem, drama, forgetting cycle that we tend to be in through the media. My province is northeast, so it's like the last part of Afghanistan. It's called Roof of the World. This week I finally spoke to Fausia Kufi, Afghanistan's first female parliament speaker, a noted activist for women and children's rights, and has been one of the women who participated in the peace talks with the Taliban in Doha over the last few years. After Afghanistan was surrendered to the Taliban, she stayed for two more weeks, but decided to leave in the end, not because she feared for her life, but because under house arrest, she was afraid not to be effective anymore. In 2010, I traveled with Fauzia to Badakhshan, the province in northern Afghanistan where she's from. We went by road after a failed attempt with a Russian MI-8 helicopter that could not make it over the mountain range to the north. So we took the Salang Tunnel, the highest tunnel in the world, to the north, through Kunduz, Takhar, Faizabad, and deeper into the northeastern regions, where back in 2004, I had built two schools, while I managed a project to build 200 schools for UNICEF. Back then, to build those schools, we needed to travel more than a day by donkey to get there. In 2010, only six years later, we passed those two schools by road, and it totally took me by surprise. I could not believe the difference in access. That road is the legacy of Fauzia, who made education, healthcare, and markets in the remote province of Badakhshan accessible. I was just telling the girls the, the photo that you take when uh, you took when we were coming from Faizabad to Takhar, remember? I was with the in the coochies in the tents close to the um, ships. And I think, um, you know, I was smiling that picture with red, with um, black clothes. I think it's kind of all over in social, in, in media now. I was telling them that you took that picture. We were owning a country. Things were much better. It has become literally impossible for us to, to survive anymore or politically be there. I... I feel that the, the foundations of why the US was, or why the NATO was in Afghanistan was fundamentally wrong anyway. Well, actually the reason they came to Afghanistan uh, is not because they thought that uh, they are going to protect Afghans. When they came to Afghanistan, they actually hardly consulted with people on what they want to do. And now they left Afghanistan without asking people. And this evacuation was another nightmare, unfortunately. 20 years back, we were told that the Taliban are terrorists. They should be in the sanction list. No discussions with them, no dialogue, no talks. They're terrorists. 20 years later, the Americans actually signed an agreement with them. Um, as a partner without even including the Afghan government or the politicians or the state. Uh, around 200 people were killed, Afghans, um, with 13 um, US Marines, which our hearts are with the families of those who lost their lives, or sympathy as well. But nobody actually, it did not make the, the headlines that 200, 200 lives were lost among them, some of our talents, educated journalists and civil society activists who were waiting to go to a safer place. Afghan lives does, do not matter at all. 210,000 Afghans have died in the last 20 years. 
but actually the reason that more in, um, military extremist grou groups actually grow, even in the past 20 years, more of them, is because you know, the Americans were there and they thought it's a jihad against them. Um, the, the, the more Americans, the more military extremist groups and the more people on the ground are killed. You're right, I feel I'm completely devastated, to be honest, from morning to till evening since the, the past 24 hours that I'm in Doha now, my energy is drained because of what is happening in Afghanistan. Yes, the previous government is to be blamed for most of it, but who brought the previous president? It was the United States actually in 2014 that brought um, the president who was never elected. He did not win the election. Now we see that, um, that um, a, a, an imposed leader, uh, which has no base, baseless, what will bring to the country? His, legitimate, his legacy is, you know, a collapsed institution, 20 years wasted, blood and treasure. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. I don't even have words to, to describe the, the situation most of us are. Osea, what is your take? Because you've been part of the peace talks with the Taliban. What is your take on the Taliban today? engaged with Taliban for the past four years. When I first started my engagement and dialogue with them, I was criticized by many people, including civil society activists from Afghanistan, that why are you reconstructing the Taliban's image? And my point then, and still my point is that it is easy to talk and negotiate and engage with people that you share view. It's extremely difficult to view, to share your, your you know, dialogue and engage with people that has that have so much difference of opinion. So let's work with them, and uh, because I knew that Americans are going to sign agreement with them, I knew that they're going to give them political boost. So my thing was that let's engage with them, and that's why I actually stayed for two weeks or more in Kabul after they came. Although I was an, uh, under extremely difficult, uh, challenging, personally challenging environment, but I wanted to talk to them and engage in a way to represent uh, the transformation of Afghanistan. What, what is your take on the Taliban right now? What's happening right now? And what is the best or the worst thing to do in this whole situation? To represent a generation that is transformed and introduce them to a generation that is unavoidable. And I believe that we have to continue our engagement with them because I think um, it is important for them to know that without um, an inclusive and representative government, um, the war will not end. Marcia, what is the difference between the Taliban then, say 20 years ago, funded by the US, obviously, <laughs> at that time, and the Taliban today, which is not funded by the US. And what is their willingness, what have you seen as their willingness to, to be different? Well, uh, I must say that uh, those foot soldiers and uh, grassroots commanders are the ones that have picked a gun in the past 20 years, if he was 10 years old, when the Americans went, he is now 30 years old. Majority of those Taliban um, who are fighting or who are like fighters are 30, 35 below. So they are the ones who actually, you know, have seen some of this Afghanistan, different Afghanistan. They're not educated mostly. They have been told, uh, you know, they the narratives are given to them, so they fight. Some of their leaders, I know that there, we all know that there are different fractions of the Taliban. Um, so the Haqqani, the, the Taliban of Mullah Omar, uh, you know, the Taliban um, uh, fighters. And I think um, already you could see that there are some political differences. Um, so I think, yes, somehow ideological uh, Taliban are there. 
but mostly people who, um, you know, due to poverty, due to lack of education, due to uh, lack of opportunities actually join them. And, and some of them I'm, I'm worried because I also met them in Kabul when they came, a lot of them. They're young boys, 18, 17, 20 years old. Um, they're not educated. What will happen to their future? Because the moment you disarm them and take the gun from them, they do not have any other skill to um, use it for their future. So that is going to be another risk for their future if they do not properly you know, become a normal civilized human being. Over the past few years, corruption was eating the country's economy. Uh, millions of dollars were actually in the pockets of those who were not loyal to the country. And we saw that they actually fleed with millions of dollars. So corruption was the main challenge uh, and nepotism, of course, which actually made a lot of people join Taliban forces. Over time, I think one of the reasons that the government collapsed was lack of hope and aspiration and people were desperate because they were and, and I was talking to some of those commanders on our army and police about the fact that they were surrendering to Taliban. They say, Ms. Kofi, there is no difference for us because this president is all is also corrupt, not attached to the people, um, you know, power centric. What is the difference? There is no difference for ordinary people. What is the way forward? How can we, from within, um, support better life and better safety in Afghanistan? Because livelihoods is everything. So, you know, you and I went through Badakhshan, uh, traveled through Badakhshan. Um, uh, uh, you've done so much infrastructure, basic infrastructure projects and helping local communities to get access to schools, get access to you know, bigger cities and the um, making basic, basic facilities accessible for people, making livelihoods feasible is the way to build peace, obviously. Although that is never understood by the governments that just see the big money by big contracts to international contractors and do not hire the, um, the Afghans to do that. I mean, I remember very well when I was building schools in Nuristan, that I was forced to use international contractors to build them and I refused. And ultimately, that got me interrogated in the US embassy in Kabul because I had to be corrupt, of course, because I was not working with the international contractors, but I was actually employing Afghans to build the schools for their own children. That's the way to do that. So creating livelihoods, making sure that people get paid for the jobs that they're doing, um, making sure that people get paid so they can sustain their families is the way to build peace. Do not sanction Afghanistan. Do you, do you agree? Well, I agree to some extent because I think, um, yes, international aid to um, reach out to local communities. Uh, we do not want aid to be, uh, you know, we do not want that huge discrepancy. Already in a society which majority are jobless. Um, so jo job creation uh, in opportunities, using the natural resources of Afghanistan properly uh, to um, you know, boast the country's economy. The private sector in Afghanistan is weak, so everybody see the government as a main source of uh, income. The government need to decentralize a little bit. Um, we are promoting a parliamentary system where um, there is a, you know, um, uh, more uh, authorities in the provinces, more power to the governors, more power to the district in terms of ad a budget and administrative power. Um, but uh, uh, also, I think, um, in terms of uh, uh, work, uh, uh, you mentioned the contracts, I fully agree. I think, um, uh, starting from the top, most of these contracts, until they got to the beneficiaries, probably 30% was left, 70% was spent on the way to get to the people.
So do you feel there is willingness in the, in the current Taliban leaders, um, willingness to be more diverse, to be more inclusive, um, to be more moderate versus what we know from 20 years ago? Do you, do, do you feel that there's capacity and uh, willingness to engage? My hope was that there are like 20 years of uh, international exposure to countries like Qatar and others where they are Muslim, they could be role model for them, will put them in a position that they will accept. Also, I mean, the fact that Afghanistan has changed over the past 20 years in terms of generation and transformation, you know, the media, the social media, etc. My hope is that they will actually adopt. I think some of the jihadi leaders, if you listen to their speeches 30 years back, most of them had the same view. But over time, they melted in the society and they reintegrated and changed. Some of them actually make their daughters run for parliament, their sons run for parliament. They have changed, they have become more moderate. My hope is that over time, they will become also moderate. Uh, the society will observe them. Uh, we have seen in other countries uh, that the, the extremists actually were observed in the society. So what do, you, what do you see is happening right now? Because in the isolation, in vilifying the Taliban, like, oh, there's the terrorists, they're doing this. And then the, you know, the news comes out about the first executions in the street. And that only fuels the fire of, you know, they're the bad guys. Um, what is the way forward? What is the message to the world? In how um, to engage you know, right I now? actually was... One day um, wearing a burqa, and I think you know that I did that when we were going to Kunduz at some, remember that? <laughs> yeah, with your sister in the back. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He called me Bashir in the front with my, with yeah. my Taliban scarf. <laughs> yeah, you remember that? <laughs> you were in the front seat, right? <laughs> and oh, that was good. <laughs> My sister and I in the back seat with workers uncovered, and you were in the front seat with yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that memory. I times. wore a burqa and I went around in Kabul to see how is it. And I saw a young boy uh, accused of uh, stealing a mobile phone or something. They put the uh, you know black thing in his face and make him stand in the main street. So that everybody that crosses the road could see him. He, the poor guy, I mean, yeah, he, he stole something. Uh, but there is a way to treat that. That could bring me to the point that why are we like in a mode to destroy and like revenge and be harsh? Their knowledge of Islamic values is not very high. That's the reason because they, you know, have a gun and the gun gave them identity and they try to demonstrate power and identity. They say they're Islamic values, but you know, you're a Muslim, I'm a Muslim. I think we've got like basic values in place that make us better humans. Why do people turn to destruction if they say it's based in values? Because it doesn't make any sense. I think it is a psychological effect of war. These people have grown up in war, uh, found their identity identity through war. I've, I've worked in, in different countries in, in Afghanistan the longest, where in fact everybody is traumatized and we don't realize what it does to people when we're traumatized. And 10 years ago, I did not have the luxury of setting goals. Trauma takes that privilege away from a person. Trauma holds you to each and every moment as a life and death struggle. Trauma takes away your capacity to, to understand that there is more to life than just fighting against nothing and everything all at once. Trauma takes away your ability to see yourself as a whole person. Um. The healing mechanism is not there. That's exactly. healing because it's again uh, military takeover, one force come, uh, you know, get rid of the other force, the other government, then they go for revenge. There is no proper way of like pardoning, healing process, 
where people will, because it's not even one side. And when we are talking about victims of war, it's not those victims who actually lived in Kabul um, and, and were killed, but those victims who are in the villages, Taliban's family. I know some of the Taliban who actually paid also the high price in this war. Um, so that healing process, I mean, it, and unfortunately, during the negotiation, we actually planned for all of this, but things went absolutely the other way as we planned and opposite. So we don't have it anymore, but we wanted to have like a healing process for victims of war because everybody is victim of war, unfortunately. What is the, what is the start of healing? I think, yes, again, on peace education, livelihood, uh, some level of justice, I think, we have to keep it open for people if they want to re really bring their cases to justice. It cannot be, um, you know, a blank amnesty. Um, it has to be, I mean, yes, the Taliban announced amnesty and the question is, how will people actually pardon them? Mm -hmm. Will people pardon them? Will people respond? You know, are they happy about this amnesty? Do they have anything to listen to? Um, a mother who lost his um, son and his son was a social media influencer. And he had some of these motivational speech about the smile and the importance of smile and laugh in your life. Mm. Um, he was a university student at Kabul University, one of the very, you know, inspiring young boy. I met his, uh, his mother a couple of months ago, I think early July. And you could see the pain in her face. Even after almost a year, she lost, she lost her son. We need to listen to her. They need to listen to her. So it's not amnesty to the people who are already a victim. So I think, yes, listening, livelihood, creating opportunities for people to see there is a hope and they don't go for revenge through violence, a whole uh, package of uh, you know, things to be done. What is, what is your personal um, plan? Like you just came out of Afghanistan, not as you said, to fear for your, because you feared for your life, because, but because you feared not to be effective when in house arrest. How can we show up with you to be as effective as possible? What is your plan? When are you going back to Afghanistan? What does it take for you to go back to Afghanistan? Um, Waiting to see how they, moving forward, how the government will respond to the population's desire of a better life, of freedom and liberties, um, you know, of respecting human rights of people. Uh, I will wait and see how that actually evolves. In the meantime, I will, um, uh, hopefully with your support and others, uh, there are certain people that are really at risk still mm -hmm. because of who they were not necessarily by Taliban, but because as Taliban say 30,000 criminals are released, people who had personal uh, retaliation and revenge, these things should actually be should taken into, into account. And um, so some people transfer some people to safer place, but work also on education and education for the Taliban as well. I mean, the Taliban young boy, this guy, when he was at my gate, and eventually he told me, he developed some relationship with me and he said, he wants higher education. I will be trained to hire him, uh, to, to give him the opportunity to attend higher education and become uh, an effective human being, a positive um, energy to his society. I'll continue to provide those kind of support to people, especially to the woman, because I think the response to the military extremism is education. If you right. educate, provide alternative to the people, but we will work together to give uh, livelihood to the people so yes. that they don't see uh, extremism as the, the alternative for livelihood, but a better way of life. Um, and also internationally, I will continue to campaign for uh, attention to Afghanistan, attention to the women of Afghanistan. Abandonment of, of Afghanistan is not a solution. It will put us at a situation where we have to, we can be easy recruiters to the other military extremists groups if we are abandoned. 
that I graduated this May and I wanted to like uh, do my own business in Afghanistan, but considering the situation right now, that has to be in pause for a while, I guess. Mm -hmm. Tabrik, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi, <laughs> how are you? It's so good to see you. As you know, I'm deeply in love with Afghanistan and the people and... Um, Who is not? If you are in Afghanistan once, um, you always have it here. And can you imagine how difficult it was for me to leave, even if it's for a short period of time, but to leave the country and the people in that situation where they wanted me to be there. I feel guilty, but there was no way that I could stay there and I could be affected. Um, and um, I'm so glad to see you, though. old friend of Afghans and Afghanistan, and you have done a lot. So thank you so much. We stay in touch. We stay in touch for sure, Sharjah. Lots of love, lots of love. All right. <laughs>